glad you're here this morning. Have your Bibles open to the book of Colossians, if you would. Have your Bibles open to the book of Colossians. Thank you for coming this morning, for being here as we look at the Word of God in the next few minutes. I want to turn our attention to Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know what you know about Jesus Christ. For some, he is only, those words are only curse words. For others who have been introduced to Jesus Christ, they represent something far greater. And this morning and this afternoon from this passage, Colossians chapter 1, with this idea that Jesus is completely capable. Completely capable. Let's look at the scripture, if you would, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 19. Well, the Bible says this, For it pleased the Father that in him, that is in Jesus, should all fullness dwell. Having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself by him, I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. Lord, I thank you for this time. Lord, I pray that you'd help us as we look at your word, that you would direct us, you would guide us. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here who doesn't know you as their Savior, that today they would trust you. And Lord, I pray that as we live in you, that you'd give us those things and tools that we need. Lord, you're completely capable. Lord, I need your help this morning. Lord, I pray you'd help us during this time. you touch us and change us. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. Colossians written to a church about Jesus Christ. The point of, of the book is Jesus Christ, turning people to Jesus Christ. Maybe you've seen uh, the image of a, a man on a cross. It's Jesus Christ who died on the cross. But Jesus is so much more than just someone who died on the cross. This passage teaches us about Jesus that he is completely capable. Or if I can, in the vernacular, my Jesus is better than your Jesus. Maybe you've been around young boys when they play that little game, my dad is better than your dad. Boys before the age of 12 or so, I often idolize their fathers, all right, from 13 on, um, but then not so much, and then at about 21, 22, they come back around. But young boys, the story's told, three young boys, Bart, Buddy, and Chuck were on a school bus one day. Playing this game, my dad is better than your dad. Bart said this, my dad's way faster than all your dads. In fact, my dad can throw a 120 mile per hour fastball, run from the mound, pick up his bat, strike a home run, and make it back home before the ball even touches the ground. Bart let off in a pretty good way, but Buddy wasn't about to be outdone by Bart's father. Buddy said, oh yeah? Well, my dad can fire a bullet from his 30 out 6 He can run down range, pick up the target, and have it hit the bullseye before the bullet gets there. Well, Chuck, the last boy, was kind of at wit's end, apparently, as the story goes. Chuck said, well, my dad doesn't, your dad doesn't even come close to how fast my dad is. My dad's a 10th grade teacher. And he works every day till 4 o'clock and gets home at 3.30. <laughs> That's terrible. My wife's a teacher. That's terrible. That's terrible. <laughs> there are another three boys all talking about their fathers as well. They're talking about what their fathers did for a living. And the first boy, we'll call him Billy. Billy said, listen, he goes, my dad is so amazing that he wrote a few words on a piece of paper. They called it a poem. They sent it away, and they gave him 100 bucks for that poem. Second boy, Joe. Joe said, that's nothing. My dad wrote a few more words on a piece of paper. They called it a story. They sent it off, and they gave him $1,000 for it. Well, old Johnny was the last boy there. He said, that's nothing. He said, my dad wrote a few words on a piece of paper. He stood up in front of church and, and, he, and he said those words and it took, it took 15 men with plates to collect all the money they got from that. <laughs> wow. My dad's better than your dad. Well, we could, we could spend the next few minutes talking about our fathers, but that's not the point this morning now, is it? 
I want to look at Jesus Christ and my Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible, is better than any other God. Jesus is better than anyone else. Jesus is the best there is. I don't know what you know about him this morning or if you've been introduced to him before or not, but today, my friend, let me introduce you to Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us right here in the book of Colossians of an interesting and dynamic idea about Jesus Christ in verse number 19, where the Bible says, for it pleased the Father, that is God the Father, that in him, that is Jesus, should all fullness dwell. What that means is that Jesus Christ was completely full of God. He is God. And when he came to earth, he was just as much God when he was on earth as he was when he was in heaven. The first thing I want you to know that Jesus Christ was co-existent. He was complete. He was full deity. He was full of wisdom. He was full of power. He was full of grace. There was no problem that Jesus Christ could not and cannot solve. He is completely capable. He was the fullness. He was complete. The idea is that nothing was left out. You ever packed for a trip? You show up on your trip, and maybe you're on an airplane, and you unpack your bag, and you realize that the fullness was not there. I have forgotten, and it's usually the things that we need most. I have forgotten my toothbrush. I can survive without an extra four pairs of socks. Can you survive without a toothbrush? A few years back, I was preaching in a church of a friend of mine on a Sunday morning. We'd gone down on a Saturday and done training for them. And Sunday morning, I'm going to preach. We get up at the hotel, my wife and the kids and I, we wake up. It's about 0730 on a Sunday morning. And I pull out my clothes and I get ready to take a shower. And I realize that I had my jeans and I had my khaki pants and I didn't have my suit. And it's Sunday morning. And it's 730. How do you make that phone call? Hey, guess what? This morning I'm preaching in jeans and a t-shirt because that's what I have. But my teeth will be brushed. <laughs> and it was a place I could actually go and drive and I got, I got clothes very, very, well, I drove, I drove the speed limit <laughs> the entire time. I'm feeling a little bit judged this morning. I feel a little judged. Fullness. Jesus Christ wasn't lacking anything. Jesus Christ wasn't lacking in any single department. He was the fullness. He was complete. Completely God and completely human. I love the fact that Jesus Christ was both at the same time. He was fully human. In fact, the Bible says this, For we have not an high priest, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. The Bible teaches us, the Bible shows us, explains to us that Jesus Christ, while he was here on earth, was fully human. The Bible talks about the time that he ate. Talks about the time that he cried, felt emotions. Talks about the time that he slept. All human characteristics. God doesn't need to eat. God doesn't need to sleep, but Jesus Christ, as fully human, did those things that humans do, that you and I do. We eat. Most of us, every day. And beyond that, most of us, multiple times a day. And most of us, more times than probably we should during the day. Oh, I'm dying right now. It's snack time. I'll ask my kids on the way to school in the morning what they're looking for, and I have one child who is truly after, after their parents, and I say, what are you looking forward to? And with just complete innocence, they say, oh, snack time, lunch time. We love to eat at the Howell House. In fact, it can be said that even we live to eat at the Howell House. We don't eat to live, we live to eat. We enjoy that. And most people do, if we're honest. Most have a little bit of a a guilty pleasure, the extra donut, the chocolate, the extra chocolate, the extra, extra chocolate, the extra, extra, extra chocolate that was after the extra chocolate that just happened to be there and so can't let it go to waste. There's just one little piece left. I've eat that. Jesus Christ ate because he was fully human. The fullness, he was human. The time he slept, we know he was on a boat and the disciples were in trouble and they felt the storm all about them and Jesus was asleep on a pillow. 
Now, if that's not human, I don't know what is. How many like their pillow? Anybody? Come on, am I the only one? If I travel, I miss my pillow. My pillow. I have kids. Sometimes they touch my pillow. Rule in the Howell house, don't touch dad's pillow. Don't move it. It's just like he wants it. Jesus Christ was asleep on a pillow. Fully human. See, Jesus Christ is the best there is because at the same time he was God, we'll look at that in just a moment, he was completely human. He thought. He felt. He ate. He slept. He cried. Fully human. The Bible tells us at the same time he was fully God. Because, you see, being fully human is not amazing to us. You look around and you see people who are fully human. You look around and you see other people like yourself in the flesh. You can touch and you can see that they eat, that they sleep, that they brush their teeth just like you do. But what's amazing is that Jesus Christ was also fully God. That in him, verse 19 says, all the fullness should dwell. The completeness of God, the Godhead. He was fully God at the same time. In fact, in Scripture, in the Gospels, in the New Testament, you'll find times that Jesus displays his deity, his God attributes. Sometimes he will read people's minds. That is a God attribute. You ladies may think you know what your husband's thinking, and you may be right 95% of the time. Men were pretty simple often. But Jesus Christ as God was always right. In fact, there was one time that the disciples were arguing about who would be the greatest. Well, I'm going to be the greatest. They're going to be the greatest. And Jesus, knowing what they were arguing about, asked them, hey, what you guys argue about a few moments ago? What were you talking about? And they were guilty. Uh Uh-oh. See, Jesus Christ was fully divine at the same time. Jesus Christ was co-existent. In fact, the Bible says, in the beginning was the word of Jesus Christ, and the word was with God, and the word was God. In Hebrews, the Bible says, but under the sun he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness. There are those that will say, well, Jesus was a good man, a good teacher, but he wasn't God. And my friend, Jesus Christ is God. When he came to earth, he came as God. He did not set aside his deity. There are some that will say, well, I'll accept Jesus as a good teacher, as a good man, but I can't accept his claim to be God. And that is one thing that we cannot say. You see, you must make a decision. Either Jesus Christ is the Son of God... Or he was a madman. Either he is God or he was foolish. You can shut him up as a fool. Or fall at his feet and call him Lord. As God, he is all-knowing. We use the word omniscient. As God, he is all-powerful. We use the word omnipotent. As God, he is omnipresent. He is everywhere. He is God, the fullness. He was completely God. There's a young girl. Her name was Mackenzie. Her Sunday school teacher had encouraged everyone to talk about Jesus Christ. And they said that Jesus is everywhere. Little Mackenzie said this, though. Well, I know somewhere he's not. Well, Sunday school teacher, not to be outdone, the class said, well, young lady, Jesus Christ is everywhere. Little Mackenzie said, well, I do know somewhere he's not. He's not in the grave any longer. (laughs) From the mouth of children. See, Jesus Christ, he died on the cross as a human. He died on the cross as God. He died on the cross to pay for the sin of mankind. Buried in the ground for three days, rose from the dead, raised back to life by God, and now lives and resides in heaven. Someone said this, the life of Jesus Christ is bracketed by two impossibilities. A virgin's womb and an empty tomb. No one has been born of a virgin before or since other than Jesus Christ, a sign of God. No one, no one has been raised like Jesus has as God. 
They said Jesus walked through the door to this world through a door marked no entrance. And he left through a door marked no exit. Jesus Christ is God. Verse 19 shows us that Jesus Christ is completely capable. My Jesus is better than your Jesus. My God is powerful. My God is loving. My God is merciful. But the verse goes beyond that. The verses go beyond that. Look, if you would please, in verse number 20, the next verse. Because Christ was coexistent. But the problem is that man is deficient. Look at verse 20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. You see, Jesus Christ, when he came to earth, he came with a very specific purpose. He came with a very specific purpose plan. Jesus Christ did not just come down the earth just to walk around and see how earth was going. In fact, there are sometimes in mythology that they will have stories in mythological beings they are not the true God about these gods walking around and seeing how people are doing. That is not why Jesus Christ came to earth. He came with a very specific purpose and the verse tells us he came to help make peace. There is conflict all around us. Sometimes a conflict happens inside of relationships and a husband and wife. Jesus Christ came to bring peace. Sometimes there's conflict between two cultures. There's conflict in the Middle East. There is conflict all around us. Jesus Christ came to bring peace and specifically came to make peace between us and God the Father. He came to make peace between us and God. The Bible says that all of us are sinners, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every single person who has ever lived on this earth, except for Jesus Christ, is born a sinner. Sin, doing something that God says not to do. Maybe you're familiar with the Ten Commandments. Some of them are not supposed to lie and steal, kill. The fact is, most of us have not broken all of them. But none of us have kept all of them. The Bible says, for all have sinned. We've all done something we're not supposed to do, something that is in opposition to God. God is a holy God. In God, there is no sin. As humans, we are sinful. Because of that sin, we're in opposition to God. Jesus Christ came because we're deficient to bring peace between us and God. The greatest problem that we have is opposition to God. It's a sin problem. Naturally, God and man are not okay. Naturally, God and man are naturally at enmity or enemies. Have you ever had an enemy? Someone who just wanted you to be destroyed. You've probably had some irritants. Some people you just don't get along with. Some people that just like, you know what? Of the three choices in the room, you, a dental hygienist, my teeth weren't done, or shots, I choose one of these two options. But a true enemy. The Bible says that before we're saved, we're at enmity with the Father. We're enemies with Him. Jesus Christ came to make peace. The greatest problem is sin, a sin problem. But we see it as we live our life when we do things our way and set ourselves up and make our own choices. Because of our sin, we can't go to heaven. The Bible says, like the verse I shared, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God is up here in holiness and perfection. No matter what we do because of our sin, we just can't make it. No matter how hard we try, no matter how much we do, we can't be good enough. We can't give enough. We can't go to enough church. We come short of the glory of God. No matter how many times we shoot at that mark, we will miss it. But Jesus Christ came to make peace between us and God. The greatest problem is opposition, sin with God. The greatest solution is the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what that verse says. And having made peace 
through his blood of his cross. The Bible says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and unto all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. My friend, the Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave. And he gave, the Bible says, his only begotten son. His son's name was Jesus. Jesus Christ, who is completely God, is completely capable of bringing peace in your life and my life with God. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Completely capable if we trust him, trust that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, trust that Jesus Christ was buried, trust that he rose again, trust him to take away our sins. The Bible says he will do just that. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Ernest Hemingway, a great author, wrote a story, a short story about forgiveness. Sons and fathers. In his story, Ernest Hemingway's story, there was a man by the name of Paco. Paco was at odds with his father. This short story is set in Spain. Paco wanted to become a matador and to escape his father's control. In the story, the short story that Ernest Hemingway wrote, Paco ran away, ran away from his father and from his household, but the father desired to reconcile his relationship with his son. Now look in verse 20 where the Bible says, the last word there I believe it is, where, where the Bible says that Jesus Christ, or near the end, that he reconciled, right in the middle there, by him to reconcile. And in the short story, uh, this man, Paco's father, wanted to reconcile, wanted to restore, to bring back to harmony the relationship. That is exactly what Jesus Christ did for us, between us and God. He wanted to bring back the harmony to reconcile. And in the story, Paco ran away from home and said, I'm going to live my own life. I'm going to do my own thing. I reject your control. I reject your authority. But the father in the story wanted to reconcile with his son. Reminds me of what God wants to do for you and for me. The plan for salvation was not my idea. Your idea was God's idea, the father's idea. He wants to reconcile. In the story, the father puts a simple ad in the newspaper. A simple ad. And he said, here was what the ad said in the story. Dear Paco, meet me in front of the Madrid newspaper office tomorrow at noon. All is forgiven. I love you. Imagine you're Paco. You've run away from home. You're an enemy to your odds with your father, but you see this ad, this advertisement in the paper. All is forgiven. I love you. See, Paco had to make a choice, did he not? Paco could read about that, and he had to make a choice whether he was going to respond to it or not. He could read about what his father put in the paper. He could read that his father loved him, his father forgave him, but Paco had to make a choice to show up at the Madrid newspaper the next day. Just like you and I in our life, we can know about the gift of God, eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We can know that Jesus Christ died on the cross, but we have to respond to it. It's not enough just to know. We must respond and believe by faith. As the story goes, Hemingway writes this, the next day at noon, in front of the Madrid newspaper office, there were 800 Pacos, all seeking forgiveness. I wonder in this world how many Pacos there are who want the forgiveness of God, who know that, you know what, I'm not good enough, I'm empty. I can't make it to heaven on my own. And learn that God loved him. Sent his son Jesus to die. Jesus who is completely capable. Jesus who is completely God, coexistent. What we must do is come back to God. 
God says, I love you. All can be forgiven. Satan might knock on the door of your heart and say, listen, you're not worthy. You're too bad. But Jesus Christ answers back. They may be, but I'm capable. Perhaps today you need forgiveness. Jesus Christ fully capable. It's a simple thing to trust Jesus Christ. In fact, Jesus in the Bible uses illustrations like this to trust Jesus Christ is as simple as eating a piece of bread. I think most of us could probably handle that okay. Another time, Jesus says it's as simple as taking a sip of water. I think most of us could handle that okay. Coming to Jesus Christ and believing on him is not a hard thing, but it does require a response. Now, that story by Ernest Hemingway is just a story, just a short story. But I don't know about you, sometimes my mind wanders just a little bit. You have to wonder, what if Paco had read that advertisement and said, you know what, I just don't think I'll go tomorrow. The father's offer would have still been just as valid, but it would not have been as meaningful or effective if Paco hadn't responded. And my friend, this morning, God has an offer for you and for me, and that offer is life in heaven through Jesus Christ, who was fully God and fully man, died on the cross to save your sin and to save my sin. And by trusting in him, he'll forgive you. He will make you at peace with God. I was six years old when I asked Jesus Christ to save me from my sins. It was on a Sunday. Lived in Pensacola, Florida. Sunday, at, uh, Sunday morning, junior church, I think it was. When I knew that I was a sinner, but that God loved me and Jesus died for me. And that day, I asked Jesus Christ to save me from my sins. You know what, the, you know what he did? He did that. How do I know that? Because the Bible says that he did. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jesus Christ is the greatest solution to the greatest problem. At peace with God, only through Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you for this day. Thank you for this time. Lord, I pray that you would help us these next few moments to be honest, to be clear. Lord, I want those who don't know you as their Savior to trust you today. Lord, I'm praying that you would work in hearts. I wonder if you're here this morning. Perhaps you're visiting with us, invited by a friend or saw a flyer. Perhaps you've been here many, many weeks. But you know that deep inside your heart, you're not right with God. Inside here, you're not, you're not okay with God. The Bible says that we're all sinners. We're born not okay with God. But by Jesus Christ, he can make us to be okay with God. I wonder if you're here this morning and inside your heart you know that you need to trust Jesus Christ. My friend, in the quietness of this moment, right where you're at, you can trust him today. You can pray a simple prayer right in your seat. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to pay for my sin. But I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sin. And he was buried and rose again. Please save me. And I wonder this morning if you'd be willing to trust Jesus Christ right where you're at. There's not some magic words to say that will help you pray a simple prayer. The Bible says, with the heart, man believeth. And I wonder if while you're sitting there this morning, I wonder if maybe in your heart, deep down, you say, no, Pastor. I need to trust Jesus Christ as my Savior. My friend, I wonder if you'd be willing to pray right now where you sit. You can pray right in your mind. You don't have to pray out loud. But I wonder if you'd be willing to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior today. He's the greatest solution to the greatest problem. You can pray a simple prayer like this. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Tell him, he'll hear you. I know I deserve to pay for my sin. 
but I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. He was buried and rose again. Please save me. I trust in Jesus. My friend, with your heads bowed and eyes closed, I wonder if, and I believe someone just prayed that and meant that from their heart. I wonder if you'd do me a favor. I'm the only one up here looking. Would you do me a favor if you did that, if you meant that, and you just prayed that? Would you do me a favor and just say, Pastor, I did that. Would you slip your hand up real quick? I'm the only one looking around here. Say, I just prayed that. I meant that. God bless you. I see that. God bless you. Who else? I just prayed that. I meant that. God bless you. I see that. Who else? I just, I pray that. God bless you. I see that. Who else? Pastor, I asked Jesus to save me. I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing it because I want to be okay with God. Who else? With these friends. Say, Pastor, I just prayed that. I meant that. trust in Jesus Christ it's the best thing you can do in life Jesus Christ brings the answers to all of life's problems aren't you thankful for Jesus aren't you thankful he's completely capable aren't you thankful that he's not soft he's not weak but he's strong and mighty but tender and compassionate thankful that Jesus is my God. Lord, I thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for those who indicated they trusted you as their Savior. Oh God, help them to grow. Lord, I pray there's others here who have never trusted you. Lord, would you touch their heart? Would you help them to see their need for salvation? 